Uh, okay, well, without further ado, let's jump into Matthew chapter 5. Now, last week, we talked about the fact that um, uh, we've gone through Christ's birth and his baptism and his uh, being tempted in the wilderness. And here in chapter 5, we get the first bit of kind of like his public ministry, right? He's called his first four disciples, and he is jumping right in. And this is probably a passage you've heard before if you've been a member of the faith or just been around churches or church folk. Um, this is the kind of thing you've probably heard or read or been a part of. Uh, but let's go ahead and then read it for ourselves. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading in the New American Standard Version. I actually rephrase that, the New Revised Standard Version of the NRSV. Um, let's jump in. Verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down as disciples, they came to him. Then he began to speak. He taught them and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I know we could talk about all of those, and there is one more I know, but the last one changes format. These first, what is it, eight, uh, we could talk about and talk about and talk about. The one that always grabs me is, of course, blessed are those who mourn, verse four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Oftentimes, when you are in a time of mourning, you really kind of get the impression that, um, I don't know, like you got to you got to go into the, the funeral or your time of mourning, whatever, wherever you're at. And you got to have Kleenex and you have to pretend, you know, you got to put on this happy face. Um, that is not what the Bible teaches. It, there is a blessing for people who are willing to mourn. If you're going through a tough time and you're in mourning, maybe you're mourning the loss of a loved one. Perhaps you're just mourning loss of your freedom due to travel restrictions and things. Um, it's okay to mourn. In fact, uh, the Bible encourages you to mourn and mourn well, not with the goal of just wallowing in it, but a goal of eventually you will be comforted. Okay, back to the passage. Verse 11. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you false on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are to be the salt of the earth. If salt loses its taste, how can it be saltiness, be restored, right? It, it is no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out, trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A, bit, a city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, gives light to all the house. In the same way, your light should shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, two things here we have to bring up. Um, the first of which, of course, is we are to be salt, right? We're not supposed to look like, taste like everyone else we come into contact with. If you're full of Christ, right? If the Holy Spirit lives in you, you should be a new man or a woman. So when you walk through the world, people should notice that about you. You need to continue to be salty in the good way. The second thing he talks about is light, right? That um, a, a city built on a hill can't be hidden. There's lights at night. Everyone knows it's there. Uh, in the same way, your life should not be hidden. All right. Well, let's get into where it's actually going to turn because, we, like I said, this is kind of the beginning of Christ's public ministry. And people are very concerned about exactly what it is he's doing. He's really kind of um, upsetting the apple cart, if you will, when it comes to uh, public worship. Verse 17. Do not think you come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish it, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all of it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teach others to do the same will be called uh, least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. A couple quick things. One, he says he didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. I think people get that phrase twisted a little bit in that people who want to say, yeah, you're still tied to every um, jot and tittle, as he says here, every every stroke, every letter, um, 
forget the part of him not abolishing, but fulfilling, completing the law, right? Um, in fact, when the Pharisees question him later about very minute things in the law, he, they say, you have heard it, you've seen it written, right? You've heard it said. And then he explains what that law meant and says, this is the way you're to live it out. Not the letter, but the spirit. And, and so when we talk about uh, actually fulfilling the law as believers, it's much more specific. Well, not specific. It's actually broader. We actually have to struggle with the law a little more. It's not just a rule. It's considerably bigger than that. It's a lifestyle. Verse 21. You've heard it said that um, in those ancient times, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brother and sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if an insult of a brother or sister, you'll be liable to counsel. If you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Uh, so when you are offering your gift to the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Go first, be reconciled to your brother or sister. Then come and offer the gift. I'm going to pause right there. Just like I said before, um, here he says, you've heard this rule about murder. Uh, murder is much bigger than that. It actually happens between the ears. It's not about the physical act. So go and reconcile. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, verse 25, while you're on your way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge uh, to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. It means talk it out first, man. Don't go to court first. Uh, you've heard it said you should not commit adultery. I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown to hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to go to hell. You know, you can kind of look at that in a number of different ways, but each of us have portions of our life that we struggle with. Um, and here, I think that the takeaway for us is that if you know you struggle with being in a certain circumstance or a situation, um, it's much easier to cut that circumstance out than it is to go into that circumstance and struggle through it. You know, if perhaps you have a substance abuse problem, uh, a lot of people do, nothing to be ashamed of, but if you're in a place, say a bar, where you can easily fall into that, um, it's not a great idea for you to go there, white knuckle, hang out with your friends and try to go back home without having a drink. If you know you can't handle it, that location should be cut off from you. That's kind of what he's getting at here. Verse 33. Again, I, you've heard it said in those ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you've made to the Lord. I say to you, don't swear at all, either by heaven, um, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it's the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head, you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, uh, I'm sorry, let your word be yes, yes or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. I, this happens all the time. We swear to somebody we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then we fall short. So instead of falling short, let your yes be yes, let your no be you know, let your maybe be maybe, and actually do the things you have committed to do. Um, he's really calling you not to be a two-faced person. The idea that you swear you're going to do a thing that you don't have control of, it, it really is foolishness. Verse 38. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, do not listen to an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give me a cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, I just go ahead and go the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. Do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. This is very difficult because a number of times later on in the New Testament, we as believers are told not to be footstools, but be conscientious, right, of what's being asked of us. Uh, at the same time, we need to make sure that even if someone is opposed to us, we are not opposed to them. The idea of turning the other cheek, meaning you've wronged me. And, uh, you know, we just got done saying you don't put yourself in a situation uh, where you as an individual are going to fail morally. But putting yourself in a situation where someone else can hurt you is exactly what you're being called to here in verses 38 through 42. 
That is, of course, making the assumption that you can handle that without falling into sin, right? Um, so the people you give access to you, uh, that is a decision you have to make. Well, verse 43 may be one of the more difficult passages in the entire uh, 66 books of the Bible. We're going to read it anyway. We don't avoid the hard ones. Here we go. Verse 43. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So you may be the children of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know, I hear this a lot. Uh, basically, it doesn't matter what you look like or what you say or, or what your lifestyle is. If you're good to me, I'm going to be good to you. It's exactly what he is saying in verse, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, verse 46, that everybody does that, right? Uh, if someone is good to you, it's easy to be good back. The hard part is when people are harsh to you to be good right back. Take those who are clearly opposed to you, greet them, encourage them, pray for them, lift them up to the Father even when you don't feel like it. Then he ends that with be perfect, therefore as your Father is perfect. I love that. Um, we are to be seen as walking that perfect line. That is not always the easiest way to go about it. I guarantee uh, we all fail at that from time to time, um, and that's why we have a repentance cycle. Well, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll jump into our show for the day. God, thanks for a little time in your word. There really is nothing like starting out my day looking at the Holy Scriptures, seeing you clearly, seeing me clearly, letting the Holy Spirit fill us. God, everyone who is watching either on stream or on uh, on tape delay, God, I pray you'll encourage our hearts and minds. Help us to love everyone we come into contact with. Help us to do verse 44, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us. Give us the courage to look at the Bible as a whole. Not just take a single verse out, one that we like, one that we can hit other people with, one that we can feel better about ourselves with but the fulfillment of the law seeing things in fullness not in the narrow scope that sometimes we can get out of it pray all these things in the name of jesus because you told us we should amen